Thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me here today and thank you to you for attending this session. Um, so as Andre said, I'm Alison Kennedy, I'm from EPCC at the University of Edinburgh um, and the institute that I run is largely an infrastructure provider. Um, so one of the things I'd like to talk about today is obviously with, with large scale infrastructure it can be located anywhere in the world but with the right policies then we can make data available widely. So infrastructure is obviously very expensive but it's also important so um, although we don't directly deal um, at the moment very much with development data obviously uh, once we have the right sorts of policies in place for open data it's an area where, where we can support all kinds of research. So as I said I think from today uh, the main question that we want to look at is from an open data perspective uh, what's the role of policy makers? How do we set policy in such a way that it makes it easier for researchers to look for answers to questions that couldn't previously be answered? And how do we as infrastructure providers organise the data in a way that facilitates new discoveries by cross-linking and sharing data sets and uh, engage in a better way with the public? So I think the, the, the sorts of questions which we as infrastructure providers are struggling with at the moment is... Uh, Whose job is it to set the policies? How do we resolve complete competing issues? How do we fund the policy work? How do we promote the importance of policies without inhibiting the efforts of community projects and citizen science, etc.? And how can the policies that, that we put in place enhance and facilitate public engagement? So a little bit of background about my organisation. As I said, uh, we're the High Performance Computing Centre of the University of Edinburgh. So we've been around for, I think it's about 22 years now. So we run some services for the University of Edinburgh. We run some on a European basis. Uh, we've got a number of other institutes associated with us. But mainly uh, we run national supercomputers and data facilities um, for EPSRC, NERC and STFC, um, amongst others. So, as, as probably everybody here knows, UK science is funded by a number of different research councils. So the budget of these research councils is distributed, and this means that their policies can differ. So the very large facilities like high performance computing and data infrastructure is sometimes operated by separate research councils, and sometimes it's shared between them. However, HPC and data infrastructure and, and the services that we run are increasingly becoming much more international, which is one of the big drivers um, for shared policies, in that, that it's difficult to run different services for different research councils or, or to run services for projects which cut across international boundaries if you don't have shared services. Otherwise, it's difficult to collaborate and share data. So why, why a high-performance computing centre? So, so very briefly, um, when I started in HPC about 20 years ago, there were these three pillars of scientific understanding. And high-performance computing was coming in um, in computer simulation, where the idea was that there were some problems which couldn't be solved by theory or experiment because they were too big, too small, too complex, etc. So, so the role of the very large computers there was largely um, through computer simulation to generate data. However, increasingly, we're moving into a different era, um, as highlighted by, by a book called Data and, and the Fourth Paradigm, Data Intensive Scientific Discovery, whereby uh, it's the data that's driving the science, so it's the data we then have to adjust so that it's the computing uh, and the services which are analysing the data rather than generating the data. So this has meant a bit of a change for, for the way that we do things. So this book uh, was one of the first to assert that important science could be done by mining existing data using new computing and data analytics techniques. Uh, because, as we all know, the rate of accumulation of data is exceeding the rate at which the scientific community can meaningfully interpret it. So this means a number of things. Obviously, it's in everybody's interest to make data as public as possible, um, to educate more people so that they can do more with the data, um, and to increase the number of people who, who can work on data. 
So uh, after the book came out, there was an interesting blog post by somebody called Castens, uh, which pointed out that a lot of the essays in the book were about earth science. And part of the reason for that was there's, there's a lot of existing um, non-science, or not collected by the scientific community, data in earth science. For example, large archives of sea floor surveys, which were put together um, for submarine warfare. Um, so if you went out nowadays and said, hello, I'd li really like to survey the whole of the Atlantic Ocean for environmental reasons, you'd be laughed at. But uh, if the right policies are in place, then some of the data that's been collected for other reasons, um, and increasingly we have it for minerals and energy exploration, weather forecasting, water and land management, if that data can be made public and put out there, um, then there's a number of other people who will benefit from being able to share this data. So obviously here, it's the policies that are put in place to use that existing data that will be very important in incentivizing research. One of the other things we've found through our data projects is, is the money for data projects all comes for this top part. The idea being that if you can share data across communities, if you can combine data in interesting new ways to solve problems, you can, add, you can create value um, through openness and sharing. However, what of course we found is that you can't do this unless you have the whole of the, in, the other infrastructure in place, that you need to be able to store and archive data, to keep it safe and accessible, to improve data usability and reusability before you can share it. So I think that's another important role of the infrastructure providers to check that, that this whole uh, infrastructure is in place so that we can get to the point where we want to about sharing data. So I'd like to move on to look at a couple of, of the data, recent data sharing dilemmas. And I think the first one that everybody will be aware of is Climate Gate. So that happened back in 2009, where thousands of private emails between climate change scientists were taken from servers at uh, the University of East Anglia, and some of the contents were published online. Um, so this, the timing for this was very significant. It was just before a major climate change summit. Um, and some of the claims that were made by the skeptics were that global warming was a scientific conspiracy, um, and it was a plot by the government to raise taxes. So I think some of, some of the outputs uh, from the review there had important uh, ramifications for science and open sharing of data. So the scientists were cleared of manipulating data, um, but the review suggested that it should have been more open about their work, that some of the, the responses to requests for information had been unhelpful and defensive, that some emails had been deleted um, so that they would be unavailable if anybody asked for them in future, and there'd been a consistent pattern of failing to display the proper degree of openness. So the, the report then um, encouraged scientists to avoid similar allegations by opening up access to their data, um, by explaining what the processing methods and the software that they'd used were, and by honoring freedom of information requests. So this is now something that's largely been put in place, not just as a result of ClimateGate, but nowadays if you publish a paper, you're expected to make the data for your paper available um, and also indicate what software you used to produce it. But, but there were some issues highlighted um, in a couple of ones, I think, which I'll, I'll mention. Um, the tensions be between providing access to scientific data so that your research results can be independently checked and providing unlimited access to individuals or groups who may have radically different, different views from you and who may not have the scientific credentials to interpret your data in the same way as you did or may have motives to use it selectively to support their case. And the second thing which was raised, which uh, was found to be unfounded in this case, was that the peer review system, whereby if you want to publish in a reputable journal, um, your work will be looked at by a committee of your peers, it could be used, potentially could be used by academics to stop papers critical of their work being published. Well, I think this example shows that we've moved on a bit. Um, this is reported from the BBC website in April last year. Um, there was a, a fairly famous paper called, I think, Growth in a Time of Austerity, um, where a student discovered 
that a famous, this famous academic paper, which had been used by politicians to make the case for austerity cuts, in fact contained some major errors. Um, so the student had been trying to replicate the results for some academic project. Um, he couldn't do that, so when he got hold of the Excel paper, the Excel spreadsheet, he discovered that some of the data um, had been missed out of the calculations accidentally, and also that some of the data had been interpreted in a way uh, which his supervisors didn't think was the correct way to interpret it. However, I think this shows that if you do make things open, then there are members of the public or members of the other scientific communities who can come along and look at your data. So a second dilemma, I think, um, if we look at the area of conservation, where increasingly nowadays researchers out in the field can upload photographs or information about uh, rare species or, or um, other projects like that, um, how do we stop the data that's intended for projects like conservation being used by poachers? Um, so the sorts of issues here is uh, how do we create policies which will cover interactions with multiple researchers uploading data? Uh, it's possibly not practical in the field to have user agreements, privacy policies, legal policies, terms of use, etc. when somebody's uploading their data. And it's obvious that for some projects, um, the users do not intend their data to be used in certain ways. Um, but how do these data owners approve or limit access when they're uploading remotely? And who, whose job is it to control who can interpret and publish the data? Um, I'd like to move on now to a couple of examples of where open data seems to be working well at the moment. So the first is a short case study um, called How Scrutiny of Freely Available Data Might Save the NHS Money, which was published in The Economist in uh, 20, the end of 2012. So there's a company called the Open Data Institute, which was a not-for-profit company set up by the government um, to make available a lot of the healthcare data that, that has been collected in the UK. Um, along with the, the institute, there, it's co-located with a number of startup data mining companies, some of which are looking at healthcare data. So this one in particular had a project which looked at prescriptions written by family doctors in England to examine regional patterns in the prescription of statins. Um, so what they found there was huge variations by region in, re in the incidence of prescribing cheaper generic brands and the more expensive branded drugs, uh, which varied hugely in price. So the aim of this analysis was, was not to convince doctors to prescribe cheaper brands. It was to provide information so that doctors knew whether or not they were doing the same as everybody else and to inform better decision making. Um, but obviously switching to generic brands would save money. Um, so, so that's an example of something that can be done with existing data, which is out there for anyone to look at as long as they have a, it's, it's an open policy, but then they can look at it. A second one, a uh, case study, is ancient Irish text showing a volcanic link to cold weather. Well, so this may be a slightly stranger one. Um, that reusing some data which had been collected over a 1,200-year period um, in the Irish annals, researchers could trace the impact of volcanic eruptions on the climate via these old texts. Um, so they found that out of uh, 38 volcanic events, 37 of them could be associated with directly observed cold weather extremes recorded in the chronicles. So I think this is interesting in that some data that had originally been recorded um, to indicate divine omens and portents of the, the last days of the world could be reused hundreds of years later for a purpose which the writers could never have foreseen because of the way it had been documented um, and preserved over the years. I'm going to move on a little bit um, to look at the, the types of data policies that infrastructures are looking at. Um, and, and this is based on a survey which was done by a project, a European project called the Alliance for Permanent Access to the Records of Science Network. And they produced a report at the end of last year. So what they did was they, had, they did some desk-based research and they sent out a questionnaire um, which was responded, had 27 respondents from 10 countries, mainly universities and data centres. Um, so it's obviously not a huge response, but it's enough to give us some ideas. So the policies that they identified could either be internal to an organisation or a community or an institute, 
or, or commonly agreed national or international policies. So they found that, that most place, the most common policies to have in place related to digital preservation, data sharing, open access, um, authorised access and data preparation. So I don't think the, fun, the, the outcomes will come as a very large surprise. Um, but the, the first thing they found was that there was no, nothing consistent about, no consistent rules about ownership of data. And this is obviously something I think it's very, import, very important for us to resolve at a policy level. So sometimes ownership of the data resided with the depositor. Sometimes there was a very clear owner. Sometimes it was very dependent on the funding scheme of the project which generated the data. Um, sometimes it depended on how the data had been created. For example, quite a lot of data sets are derived from other data sets. So if you have using a derived data set or a combined data set, do you own it or do the people whose data you originally based it on own it? And in many cases, it was decided on a case-by-case -case basis. They found there were very few policies which specified for how long data should be preserved, whether there should be a moratorium on how long before data should be opened up to other people. The majority of them recommended or required a license, but in, in most cases, any kind of license was accepted, although open access was preferred as far as possible. Just under half required any kind of descriptive metadata to be attached. So that's data describing what the data is and how it could be used. And again, many of them didn't ask for metadata about the provenance of the data, about how to use it technically, and about what, what the rights were for it. Um, only about half the policies required some sort of persistent identifier for the data, so it could be uniquely identified. Although file formats were often specified or required, but not always. Okay, so to move on to a little bit about what we're actually doing in Edinburgh and the sorts of projects we are working on. Um, we're currently running something called the Research Data Facility. So it's an EPSERC data store co-located in Edinburgh with the Archer National Supercomputing Service. So it's funded by EPSRC, it's hosted by the University of Edinburgh, and it's managed by EPCC. So it's been upgraded as we speak today, um, but, but long term it's going to have about 30 petabytes of storage both disk and tape for UK data. So it's not just app circuits for all the research councils. So what we're doing in Edinburgh is we're using some of the lessons that we've learned from um, European collaborative data infrastructure um, and, and some big international projects like the Research Data Alliance to try and shape our approach to building services on that. So I think the first thing we have to get over to a lot of the researchers is that a long-term data archive is not just a big file store. It's not just somewhere where you dump your data after you've done your calculations or before you do your calculations. That we have to work harder to educate researchers on the importance of replicating data so it doesn't get lost, um, of establishing permanent identifiers so that the data can be identified in a few years' time, and that they have to provide some sort of basic metadata so we know what the data is. And also, for our purposes, it's very important that uh, we also have in place efficient movement of data to compute or compute to data so that we can exploit the data. Um, so we're, we're currently working on two pilots with EPSERC support, although neither of these uh, projects is in the EPSERC area. Um, so, so astronomers and um, geneticists are two of the biggest groups um, which are, are looking at producing large data sets which will be available for, for other groups to analyze. So what we're doing with them is we were trying to look at what the technical requirements are um, for them to make the data widely available via a UK uh, research data store. But we also have to consider the policy issues. So, so I think, again, that's one of the issues for us, that people expect infrastructure providers may need to be looking after the technical side of things, whereas we need to, to look, work very closely with other groups to make sure that we also consider policy considerations when we're setting up the services. So finally, um, just to summarize where we are at EPCC and what we've found so far, uh, what do we think the infrastructure providers have to do or mandate? So the first thing, obviously, is that the data which we offer has to be accessible and discoverable. So we have to enable data sets to be easily found by the outside world, 
and to be used again. So this includes obviously promoting the use of widely used formats. We have to insist that the data that's handed over to us is provided at some minimum level of reusability. So this means that it's got to be clear what the data is and how someone should use it. Ideally, there should be some examples provided of how the data could be used. And ideally, it's going to be queryable by other researchers using some well-defined applications programming interface, for example, SQL. We as infrastructures have to provide good tooling so that when the data is deposited, um, things like um, metadata, people can be encouraged to provide metadata describing their data. But the tools that we provide also have to help with reuse and refining the data in future. And finally, I think what we've realized is that it's very difficult for infrastructure providers to facilitate interdisciplinary use because we cannot know ahead of time exactly how data could or is going to be reused. So instead, what we have to do is focusing on what we can do. So what we can do is encourage data to be made available under an open license, encourage or mandate the use of a common and open data format, make sure that the data that's provided is described in a way which references other common schemes, such as using ordnance survey coordinates rather than describing something, you know, as a 50 paces north of the, the oak tree on the common or whatever. It has to be, be something that people are going to be able to find in years to come. And also um, to get people to provide digital object identifiers, which will provide a unique pointer to a data, data set and the method of tracking use and citations. So I think in order to incentivize people to deposit their data and to reuse it, we, what we have to do is to be able to credit someone who's provided data, which is to be reused, um, enable them, as I say, enable their data to be cited by other people who use it. And this is one of the things which is going to incentivize people to deposit data. So thank you very much. <laughs>